May the Lord give you his peace. Today is Franciscan Saint of the Day on January 18th, Blessed Charles of Setsi. Our reading is taken from the Pavarello's Round Table by Sister Mary of Queen of Barth, OSF, published in 1939 by the Sisters of Mary Immaculate, Juliet, Illinois. January 18th, Blessed Charles of Setsi, Confessor, First Order. Charles, the son of a lowly country folk, was born in Setsi in Italy on October 22, 1613. At the urgent request of his grandmother, the rearing of the child was entrusted to her, and the gentle boy acquired a great love of God and of prayer from the example and teaching of, his devout, of this devout lady. He grasped the truths of religion so readily that his parents anticipated the sweet hope that Charles would later become a priest. But when Charles was old enough to go to school, his studies did not meet the marked success. And so, when his schooling ended, his parents were sensible enough to put him to work in the fields with his brothers. There, in God's free nature, a new light came to the boy. From books he had not learned much, but he understood very well the wonders of God's creation. Everything conspired to raise his thoughts to heavenly things, so that his work was constantly mingled with interior prayer. He began to receive the sacraments more frequently and evinced real zeal for Christian perfection. Out of veneration for the Virgin Mother of God, he made a vow of chastity at the age of 17. And he preserved it so faithfully that the beloved of pure souls, quote, who feedeth among the lilies, unquote, seemed to have made his dwelling place in the heart of Charles. He was seized with a great desire for holiness. He read with delight the lives of the saints and related them to the others while at work. In the Franciscan church, which he often visited, he used to study the pictures of the saints with a desire to imitate them. When he was 20 years old, he fell dangerously ill so that his life was despaired of. Then he made a vow that if he would recover, he would enter the Franciscan order. At once his illness took a turn for the better, and true to his vow, although th there were many hardships overcome, Charles received the habit two years later. After his consecration to God through the vows, he advanced visibly not only in piety, but in all the duties of his state and life, so that even the oldest brothers were edified at him and followed his example. He ardently desired to shed his blood for Christ and asked that he might be sent as a lay brother to the missions in India. But a new illness frustrated the design. He was sent to a convent in Rome so that he could fully recover his health. But here God Almighty destined him for another field of labor. He received remarkable enlightenment about things divine and about the truths of religion, so that the most learned theologians were astonished at it and consulted with him on some of the most difficult questions. The cardinals, and even Pope Clement IX, sought his advice. In compliance with the will of God, he also wrote several books about spiritual things. At the same time, the pious brother remained deeply humble concerning his remarkable gift of enlightenment. He used to say to himself that our Lord in his wisdom hides such things from the wise and reveals them to the simple, to which class he belonged. He so fervently adored his Lord under the appearance of bread that one day a ray of light like an arrow went out of the sacred host and impressed a wound in his left side. This wound was still visible after his death. Charles died on the 6th, January 6th, 1670. Pope Leo XIII pronounced him blessed in 1882. His feast was observed on January 19th, but now on the 7th since 1960. On the way to make a meditation is our meditation today. Consider how blessed Charles, who had only a meager understanding of book knowledge, easily grasped the higher knowledge of the things divine. From the creature he advanced to the Creator, and from the Creator came the light and the strength necessary for a holy life. Thus he lived in a state of almost constant spiritual meditation, since the latter is nothing more nor less than the raising of our thoughts and material things to those that are eternal, to God and the consequent coming down to us of heavenly enlightenment, stimulation, and fortitude. Meditation is like the mysterious ladder which the patriarch Jacob saw, standing upon the earth and to the top thereof, touching heaven, and the angels of God ascending and descending by it. In order to be able to meditate, it is, so, it is not necessary to have great knowledge. It suffices to have a heart 
that does not cling to material things, but delights in raising itself to God. That, however, is the first requisite for meditation. How do you stand in this respect? During meditation, some souls are led by God himself, as was blessed Charles. Such souls need no instruction. But most souls follow a special order so that their minds will not wander about aimlessly. In order to meditate, we first imagine ourselves quite vividly in the presence of God and beseech God for his aid. Then we read the points of the meditation, to which end also these considerations may serve. Or we call to mind a mystery of the life and suffering of Christ. For the mystery, we seek to draw a lesson for ourselves in about the form that we would communicate it to another person, or as we would wish to have observed it at the end of our life. Then we reflect on our own past transgressions against it, sincerely repent of them, make definite resolutions for the future, and pray to God to grant us the help of his grace. Have your meditations perhaps often been poor because you did not observe some such order as this? Consider how a person should conduct himself during meditation in times of aridity and dryness of heart. Sometimes this is a trial from heaven. At such times, let the person make stronger efforts to collect his thoughts, and by means of prayers of supplication call from heaven, himself sprinkles or has others sprinkle. Sometimes aridity is caused through our own fault, because we do not utilize the graces given us, or do not derive fruit from the past meditations, or all kinds of strains and distracting thoughts and disorderly inclinations. Such distraction will disturb our meditation too. A vessel will endeavor, a vessel for a long time, smell of what it once contained. In future, therefore, endeavor through the day to keep your thoughts collected while you are occupied with the duties imposed upon you. Keep occupied with the resolutions of your last meditation and with God in order to love him more. The more you love God, the easier it will be for your heart to rise to Him during meditation. Prayer of the Church O Lord Jesus Christ, you did this marvelously wound the heart of blessed Charles with a dart from thy most sacred body. Through his intercession look graciously down upon us, and in thy goodness enkindle in our hearts the fire of thy love, who livest and reignest forever and ever. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he show his face to you and have mercy upon you. May he turn his countenance toward you and give you his peace. And may Almighty God bless you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Pax et